managed service provider in the greater Los Angeles area. TJ is both executive and lead hacker with a background in corporate IT, mobile networks and devices, virtualization, disaster recovery, network security, EFIR, and FinTech. He's not your typical executive. While often claiming he can't code, he's responsible for the corporate website and the server that it sits on. He's previously held positions as a network engineer, system in, and director at previous companies. Please welcome TJ to ShellCon 2018. Hey. So thanks everyone for, uh, for coming to my talk. Uh, I talk a little fast, so if I get too fast, say something to me, otherwise I'll just railroad you with stuff. <laughs> um, sweet. Uh, without further ado, let's get into it. So I'm cell phone dude. Uh, my friends call me TJ. Uh, I own a small MSP based out of Los Angeles, and so part of this talk is actually because we started doing this pen test Dropbox, I actually got approached by another company for an RFP that we won. And so now we're in a position where we're actually kind of further developing it into a line of business and service for our company to offer to other clients and, and actually open source and possibly sell either as a standalone device or utility or still kind of exploring what my options are in that realm. Um, if anybody's interested in working with me on the further development of this, contact me. My email's up on the screen. My Twitter's up there. My DMs are open, so uh, feel free to reach out. So the overall objective of this talk is just to show you how to configure the cellular modem stack so that you can get your you know, mobile device online through you know, PPV dialing, uh, and whether you're using a consumer grade SIM or an M2M -M SIM that allows you to do things like static addressing and other types of remote management things, pushing configurations to devices through APIs that other manufacturers and vendors have available in the IoT space and stuff like that, and then setting up an automatic reverse shell so that it'll dial over the mobile network back up to your C2. Um, the reason why is, you know, why do you want a cellular device on your pen test Dropbox? In a lot of situations where you might be doing DFAR or doing a pen test, you don't want your traffic going out over your client's network. So if you're in a situation where your client was attacked and you're sending something like this to them in response to that attack versus getting on the plane and going yourself, you don't want the attacker seeing any of your traffic coming out of it. They don't, you don't want the attacker seeing you connect up to your nodes. You don't want any of that. So you want something that's completely out of band to give you access to your hardware so that way you can do all the cool hacker stuff that you, know, you guys do for pen test stuff. Whether it's host enumeration, credentialed scanning, um, all that type of stuff. Just having the ability to just have a shell that's you know, your hardware that you're aware of that has your drivers and your scripts and all your stuff on it versus you know, getting lit up on a client's box or getting a username on a server somewhere and having to throw together your tools last minute and you know, run your install scripts trying to figure out why this won't compile and this won't work. Just way easier to send and use your own hardware. Um, so the, the other reason why is because as hacking and breaches get more evident, the problem then becomes you have a situation where companies are so large these days, when they get breached and they figure out they get breached, they think it's like, oh yeah, we got breached last week, but you dive in and you keep going through logs and you're going through shit and you find situations like, these motherfuckers have been in here for months. They've been in here for six months enumerating your network, figuring out what services you use, like everything that you do in the attempt to try to design an attack profile specifically to your business, right? So from that perspective, you know, being able to send a box to someone that's yours, that you can constantly retest, that you can constantly update the tools on, that you have unfederated access to because it's not running on their network. You don't have to worry about their firewalls, you don't have to worry about traffic and suspension devices, and other things of that nature, right? Um, some of the assumptions I'm gonna make with this talk is that you, know, you already know how to set up your C2, whether it's a physical server or something in the cloud, um, getting your you know, hardware up and running, whether it's a Raspberry Pi or you know, whatever type of hardware that's running. Uh, it's, I did the POC on this because it's like less than $100 in hardware. Uh, and so the, the next slide is actually the build of materials. So if you go Google all the stuff that I use, it ends up being like 94 bucks before you start adding in SIM cards and data access just to get a shell on someone else's network. <coughs> uh, so as far as the build of materials, actually, if you see me later, I. I tried to set up a live demo so that I could kind of go through and, and do some stuff for you guys and show you like, even with a small Raspberry Pi, you know, B plus, 
you can still do stuff like Kismet and uh, you know run Metasploit and you know still do host enumeration type stuff and you know basic like Intel gathering type things. Um, but I I think one of said shells is not up. Uh, but that that comes later. So uh, the first thing really is is configuring the actual serial modem. So a lot of the documentation online was kind of incorrect in like what serial device they were suggesting you use on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, so it, it's, it's not up here, but on all the code that I have on GitHub, it, there's a full walkthrough um, with example configuration files, um, example, like basically all the example configs necessary and, and sample dialing profiles in order to get your device online. Uh, and so with PPP specifically, uh, you can only edit the, the PPP, uh, the Pierce file that uh, allows you to dial into your cell network. It's basically like your APN profile on the standard mobile phone when you log in, type in the APN information and all that stuff. Uh, so logging in as root, you can edit the file. They provide, a, when you install PPD from your app repo, they provide a sample provider profile that's great, but it doesn't have everything for cellular. So you still have to find the proper, uh, like, there's like two or three small bits of configuration. One specifically is no off. Um, that basically logs the device in with just an APN, a no username and password because the APN network doesn't require authentication to log into it, right? Um, so from, uh, so w once you get the peers up and running, uh, then you can actually start dialing into the cellular network. So one of the things I came across while doing this was in all the documentation for most of the cellular modems and like LTE Advanced and all that stuff, they have the option for IP server mode. So by changing the chat script, you can actually request from the consumer cellular network to throw you your device and address and then throw you a routable address that you can get to just over the internet. That's one of the things I haven't got working yet because it's not documented at all, so I'm just throwing scripts at stuff, expecting it to work and failing. Um, but at some point, I did get it to work once and I did get one connection, so I, I have hope that it's possible again. Um, to circumvent that, I actually did the work and became a T-Mobile reseller, so now I sell mobile-to-mobile -mobile IoT sims, um, and that actually allows me to do static addressing for all our devices, so problem solved. Like, I don't even need a reverse tunnel anymore. Um, but in a situation where you want to do something super dirty and go grab a SIM card prepaid and you know, set something up for less than 100 bucks and yada yada, you know, whatever you do with it, that's your business. Um, configuring the interface, super easy. Uh, Auto Google, uh, iFace Google, iNet PPP, that basically is just saying, hey, uh, use this styling profile in Etsy Peers Google to dial in. I'm on project five, that's why I call it Google because I what I did, um, but in the example file that I have online, it notates where you uh, switch out the APN information for your carrier or whatever. Um, if you have problems finding your carrier's best APN information, hit me up, because I can post some links to that online. Um, once, uh, once that's all done, you configure SSH on your actual Dropbox to uh, not, now that you have your cellular modem configured, because one of the configuration files that I posted online uh, has uh, the option for persistence and then max fail set to zero. So it can fail as many times as it wants. That's actually what I'm waiting for right now. This guy's running and it's consistently failing trying to dial the network because uh, I get crappy service in here. But eventually it's going to try and get online probably after we get out the, the conference hall uh, and, and dial back into the infrastructure. So with this, SSH, uh, with this SSH configuration, no matter how long it's down for, it'll always consistently redial and reopen that tunnel back up on, you know, on your C2, get back online. Um, strict host key checking ended up being a problem for a long time, and I have no idea why to this day, but because of the routing and how I traverse through the network, host key tends to always change uh, for whatever reason. And it, and, haven't figured it out. Someone smarter than me may know better, or maybe I'm just not that smart, but there's definitely a possibility there. Um, also, hashing known hosts. The, those two, um, hash known hosts and strict host key checking, ended up being an issue 
on the cellular network just because each time the device booted, the key was different. And so because it was coming from a separate IP address for the tunnel, it's like, hey, no, this isn't the same IP you came from before. This doesn't work. You're not allowed to get in. So had to turn that off. Um, I, I'm still to this day, I'm not sure why I had to turn GSS API on because I'm not using PAM, but for the reason I did for my configuration to work. Um, and that's just, that's, those were just my experiences. Um, and then on the daemon side, simple stuff like making sure password authentication's off, um, empty passwords turned off, but turning on gateway ports and X11 forwarding so that you could forward from the device to the C2 and then from the C2 back down to your desktop if you, know, you needed graphical stuff because you suck at command line like I do. Um, uh, and that's, it, that's the basics. Like I, I have all the configuration samples posted on GitHub. Um, in, in full detail. These are just the, the items, the lines that were specific that I, I figured out that I had to change to, to make it work. So in the C2, same thing for the SSH config, host key checking turned off, hash known host turned off, and GSS API turned on. Um, and then on the daemon side, same stuff, password authentication, permanent empty passwords, X11 forwarding, yes. My default was gateway ports were turned on, so I didn't have to change that here. Uh, I've noticed different distros do different stuff with that, so it's all dependent on your install. Uh, so the, the hard part that I had getting running was actually getting auto SSH to run all the time and be consistent. I actually had to reach out to like friends of mine for help. That Pookie helped a little bit back there, thanks, thanks Pookie. Um, and so uh, on the Raspberry Pi and the Raspbian image, even though rc.local is getting depreciated, they're still using it in, in their image, so uh, you can write this auto SSH command. So walking you through it, uh, I think little f is, and I, if I'm wrong, correct me, because I know I'm wrong, um, but I think little f is, is connect and, and, and drop the shell. Uh, capital N uh, is, uh, is stay logged in even though you drop the shell and then dash capital R, those are uh, for port forwarding, right? So in this example, if you look at, this is actually my actual auto SSH command on node one, which is sitting in the contest area right now. Um, so it connects, it forwards VNC, port 8001 is a, a open source utility called Socket. It's just a small SOX proxy, so if I need to do web browsing or anything like that on the actual client network while I'm gone remotely, I can use that port on each node for whatever client network I'm on to do web browsing on their local network. Um, and then 7001 is the port I'm using for SSH because that's what I like. Uh, that's actually, so that, that host name is, uh, is the one from my crib. So don't bang on it, because I, I use that uh, a lot. I didn't think about that before I did this talk. So, so just don't bang on my house, because I'll see you. Um, but, but yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so that's the auto SSH command that opens all my tunnels on the Pies and you know, connects up to my C2 and gives me uh, the ability to do that and then log in to my shell. So I mentioned that um, on on a few of the hosts, like my desktop at home is a server uh, for these guys, so I have the VNC port forwarded to my Mac desktop because I'm freaking lazy, and like I said, I really suck at command line. So uh, I just get VNC desktops and all my Dropboxes and do all the shit I need to do on there remotely sitting in the comfort of my house. Um, that's been really wonderful because the last DFR gig was a 45 hour engagement and I did it from my house. Uh, uh, any any questions so far? Sure. Y yeah. But so okay. So my implementation, the way I did it, is I keyed each Dropbox specifically. So and they're all names. So like, if one of my keys gets exposed, I hop in the C two for my phone, nuke it, and that box can no longer connect up to my shit. 
Um, but yeah, good question. I was going to do, oh yeah, same key for everything. And I thought about it. I'm like, nah, this is for hackers. They'll take my key and use it. So, <laughs> so yeah, no, no, no single key fuckery there. How long does your battery typically last? So this is a 10,000 milliamp hour battery. Um, I, uh, this is the only physical hardware that's set up for Kismet with like a Alpha 8812 AU. So wireless auditing on this guy uh, was 11 days up and it was sitting in like a cardboard UPS box. <laughs> So like that's it. I'm actually still working out with T-Mobile. It's it it's all happened super super fast. At DEF CON, I got approached to do these for big big company, and so I really quickly went from the POC that's these versions to building it on like Intel NUC um, with like a legit 4G radio and like legit uh, uh, Realtek wire adapter and all that stuff. So um, they are going to be sold very soon. Uh, but I am going to eventually probably open source at least all the connection stuff and hardware stuffs, just not, you know, our custom tools and code and stuff. Uh, so does anyone want to see a demo? Yeah. All right. So um, I've got like eight of these things. Uh, two through seven are at my house, and zero and one are here. Zero's right here, and one's in the contest area. Unfortunately, they didn't come up, and those are the two that specifically have the Kismet drivers on them, but we can SSH to my house and go enumerate my crib if we want. <laughs> um, so AN2 is like an older Raspberry Pi 2. Uh, so if we do if config and look at what it's connected to, it's on... It's on my Ethernet and it's on Wi Fi. So. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Where's plus? Come on. Damn it. Anybody know how to do it in Bitvice? Because I sure don't. Uh, Don't yell at me. Uh, I I can't. I I I really suck at life. Uh, oh yeah, okay, that works. All right, so. All right, so that's the crib, uh, Ethernet address, and then my Wi-Fi address. So, uh, seriously? <laughs> funny, funny, funny. I can't spell or type or command line clearly. <laughs> So that's, that's a real thing. And, and I should have prefaced this talk by the fact that I'm actually not really a good pen tester. I just, I know how to do pen test stuff, uh, but like not like crazy hardcore hacker pen tester, so, so don't look at me like that. That's not, that's not me, no. Uh, but slow, slow, slow shell. Uh, any other questions while it's enumerating my network? Yep, yep. Just for the sense, I mean, like, because most of the times you do an engagement, right? And how many days you get an engagement? You get two days, you get five days, you get a week on an engagement, and you're there. And so it's all this pressure, and then you have executive teams looking at you fucking crazy while you're sitting in their conference rooms versus, like, I hate to say it, I'd rather sit at home and do whatever I do in the comfort of my crib while I hack shit and read stuff and learn. Because a lot of times I'm sitting on a network I don't know about everything they fucking run. I don't know about like every service, every piece of equipment. So I have to take five minutes RTFM for a while and then go and tack back and then go do research and then go see what CVEs are available because 
Otherwise, I'm sitting in another client's office eight hours, 10 hours a day inside their business hours, and it's like, that's not how I operate. That's not how I work. I do all my best work late at night sitting in front of a computer when no one else is fucking calling me and the phone's not ringing. So for me, having persistence inside a network that I'm either testing or I'm supposed to be protecting makes it a lot easier, especially when it's like we work in teams, right? So as cool as I may be, which I'm not, when I really need help, I call super friends like, yo, um, hop on this show real quick because I saw some shit and like I don't really know. So like you should look at it. But when you do, like, that'll be super cool because, like, I know we found some shit. I just, I don't know. Um, and, and that's the capacity for me is, is, is because a lot of times, especially being a smaller business, you know, you get, you know, kind of pigeonholed into, oh, well, why are you seeking outside help and why are you doing this and subcontractor who, subcontractor what? Bro, my m and says it all already. Like you, it already says that at any point in time, I may contract other individuals to assist and blah, blah, blah. But when you're in the moment and you're sitting in a client's office, that conversation is a lot harder to have than the executive that's paying you 20 grand to be there. And he's like, oh, but you're supposed to be the best. I'm like, yeah, I'm the best because of my friends. So. <laughs> um, wow, it's really not going to enumerate my fucking network. Uh, so. I, uh, I, I, I'll be around after. I mean, how am I doing on time? You have 41 minutes. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> that. First walk out. Yeah. So, See, now I just want to break shit. Um, what's, uh, anybody got any ideas? I mean, I got Metasploit installed on this bitch. D? Damn, it's taking so fucking long. <laughs> Had me up here looking like an asshole. Oh, that's funny. It's scanning all the SOX ports on my network. Those are, those are random SOX ports that are on all the pies, because, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I super cheated. I used Project 5. I let you have free data SIM cards. Those data SIM cards work over T-Mobile, but you can use practically anything. Like you can use any standard AT&T, T-Mobile SIM. The, the I mean, I, I do all the software updates over cellular. Um, so I, I'm, I'm pretty, the, the routes are static in that it, it will always go over the cellular connection unless it's not there. So if the cellular modem's not booted up, it'll reverse tunnel over the client's network, which, you know, which is I guess, I guess bad. I, I've got eight shells, eight of these guys. Um, they're constantly online. They've been constantly online for like the last three months while I've been testing. And my overall data usage on Phi has maybe increased about a gigabyte. Um, but like, like I said, I do all the software updates and firmware updates and shit over cellular modem. It's slow as hell because it's 2G. Like, um, and in writing this talk, they actually came out with, the uh, WaveShare came out with a new 4G hat that's designed for the Raspberry Pi. So I'm probably going to go cop a couple of those because 4G is so much faster. That's actually what this guy is. So the, the new prototype I'm building is, is based on, I guess that's what I'll talk about now. Um, so I'm building a new prototype. It's based on an Intel NUC. Uh, because Raspberry Pis are dope, but like, what does a hacker really want? Hacker really wants hardware and horsepower, like inside a client network. So, um, built an Intel NUC. I actually have a picture of it. Let's. Uh, let's uh, oh yay! So scan finished. That's my house. Um. But, but now we're 
start moving on to bigger and better pastures because now I want to show you stuff. So, and I'm kind of proud of it, so fuck it, why not, right? So, though, that's, that's, those are the new units, right? So the thing on the left, that's obvious, that's the Alpha 8814 AU. Um, the, I forget who posted it, but it's the, it's the same drivers that the Airmon guys posted for the 8812 AU and the 8814. They compiled great, not only on x86, but also on Raspberry Pi. The thing I had to do on the Raspberry Pi to get the, the alphas to work was I really suck at compiling shit. So it took me days before I figured out that in the make file, it actually has all the options for like, oh, do you want this architecture or this architecture? And there's an ARM, R Pi architecture in the fucking make file. So I read the docs too. Don't even look at me like that. I read the fucking, <laughs> they didn't say shit about the make file having all, but I guess that's like prerequisite knowledge you're supposed to have. Anyway. Um, so the Intel NUC I'm using has an i7, uh, 32 gigs of RAM with 250 gig NVMe. Um, and I guess I should just log into it and show it to you because it should be up. And it is. I, uh, so I haven't figured out mobile power for the NUC yet, except who was I just talking to that's sitting in this fucking, it was you. It was fucking bot. So, so bot, bot found some company that makes, like that's a high height, dual, that's, a, that's a dual height NUC, right? So it's basically just a tiny board with a fan and everything else, but the bottom half is basically fucking empty. He found some company, some Chinese company online, I think, that makes, yeah, what was it called? Oh wow, okay, so Mini ITX out of Michigan makes a uh, uninterruptible power supply, uh, UPS for, uh, for those things. So I, I think he said 20 minutes or some shit on, on current config, but I have a line on some battery manufacturers in China, so I'd be interested to like rip that shit apart and figure out how much of a bigger battery I can get in it. Um, but the, the use case for these is, um, is that you know, you're, you're in a situation where uh, you're either testing the company or, come on, move. So that's, that's, my, that's my pen test Dropbox. Um, come on. So it's got Virtualization on it, which was a plus. That was something that I was asked for specifically in the RFP that I did recently. Uh, the other thing was um, full uh, wireless AC auditing on five gigahertz. So those alpha adapters support AC on multiple channels and support frequency hopping. So why don't we fuck with all my neighbors? Is it already running? Fuck me. I totally showed somebody last night and I didn't turn it off. <laughs> My mom's at home. I really hope, yeah, it's whatever. I don't live next to the airport either. So, yeah, that's a thing. Um, boop -boop. So, what? Oh, come on, no. Uh, okay, cool channel. So working five gigahertz uh, auditing uh, should have a handshake probably too. No handshake. Um, wait. Yeah, no handshake. But that's working five, five gigahertz auditing on an Intel NUC with 32 gigs of RAM and uh, 250 gig NVMe. The, the other big ask for the, the RFP that I'm working on, besides wireless auditing, was having the ability to push virtual machines to a device. So if you can imagine having a cellular network capable of doing 50 up and 50 down and having to push like a four gigabyte image to it over cellular to boot it inside a target network with no trace whatsoever on said client network. Um, there's even a VPN on it, so if 
you're working in a situation on a team and you need multiple people inside this network, you can actually use each one of these as a VPN into the target network and have your team members uh, log in through that. How am I doing on time? Is it still, it's a lot of time, huh? Three thirty. Damn. Uh, <laughs> still no questions, really? Like, well, I don't, I mean, I gave you all the talking I could give. I don't, I don't know how much I want to drag this on for. Uh, I, that's, that's my box. If you guys are interested, I'll be at the bar uh, de-stressing. What's that, your favorite drink? I, I, I like beer. What's your favorite beer? Anything that has an IPA in it. <laughs> I'm a simple dude. Simple, super background, like... Again, not super hacker, I'm just a hardware nerd that really knows a lot about cellular communication. So for me, watching everyone else like build pen test drop boxes, the hack by Dropbox, my main reason for doing this was the fact that every other piece of hardware that comes out isn't really powerful enough to do anything substantial with. You end up with like a limited shell or limited capabilities and, or no libraries and no ability to really do anything substantial. So you're sitting there with all your hacker skills and all your shit and you're like, I'm just going to wait because I'm running this on a MIPS processor and so it's going to be a while. Like, and, and so having an i7 SOC that support what? I'm wrapping it up. It's, the talk's done. I, How do we find you? Where's your information? I, it's, oh. <laughs> so frustrating, Eric. Um, well, that's, that's, that's me. Uh, if you want stuff from me, uh, hit cell phone, dude. If you want to talk about work stuff or possibly helping me develop this into something that could make us all a whole bunch a lot of money, like I'm totally down. Um, the big thing that I'm working on for the prototype that I'm working on is I've got a lot of the tooling done. I've got friends helping me with some of the automated uh, enumeration stuff and host enumeration and audited, you know, uh, automated, automating the, the auditing tasks, so to speak. Um, the thing I need help with is building a web interface for it to make it super pretty and like, sellable and something that you know companies would want to buy because it's one thing to sell a device that has a shell and a VNC. It's totally something different to throw a pretty web interface on top of it and, and make it that much more useful. Um, so if anyone's interested, feel free to hit me up. Thank you. Thank you.